All right, there's a, a couple things um, that I, uh, I'd like you to do now. One is if you have your Bible with you, I want you to turn to um, the book of 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians, um, the very last chapter, chapter uh, 13, and I'm going to read not the whole chapter, just part of the chapter. And then um, after that, what we're going to do is we're going to confess uh, a couple of questions and answers as we continue our catechetical series, considering as we move on from last time, if you are here last time, remember we looked at what was called creedal Christianity. In other words, what, a, what creeds are and why they're important. And, and if you were here um, a couple of weeks ago, maybe I'm going to have to jog your memories a little bit, but um, we looked at, I think it was First Peter chapter 3, where in the Bible itself you find what many commentators and theologians believe was... Um, uh, an, either an ancient hymn or a creed of the church explaining basically the person, the work of Jesus Christ. Well, we continue with being creedal Christians today. Found in the Bible, we should be creedal Christians as well. Now, what we're going to be looking at is um, what we confess together in terms of the God whom we profess, right? The, the triune God. So what I, what I want to begin with, um, and I want to deal with this very briefly, just to let you know this past week, I was ill for a number of days, I'm fine now, and so um, I, I didn't take the time to formulate a number of questions for our post-sermon discussion, I'm just going to forego that for this, for this week. Uh, we'll pick up on that in the weeks to come as we go through our catechetical series together, but, but one question I can ask and instead of having discussion after the sermon, um, we don't have to have discussion now, but I, I just want to see if I can get some feedback on this. I want to take just a minute. So I'm going to ask this question. Who here this afternoon can give me a basic definition of what we call the Trinity? It's foundational to our Christian faith. Anybody want to make a stab at that? Anybody bold? The Trinity. What do we confess when we confess the Trinity? And maybe some of you are thinking, I think I know the answer, but I'm afraid that if I say something and it's not right, I'm going to look like a fool. We don't do that here. Okay, anybody want to make a stab at that? What is the Trinity? Got to be one. No? You're going to make a stab? Okay. Okay, so we believe in one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Is that your final answer? Don't look back. Don't look. He will not give you the right answer. What's that? So you're going to stick with that? Okay, that's one of the reasons why we nominated him to be an elder. Okay, good. So that is a correct answer. Now, I'm not going to ask the rest of you to add anything to that because you might feel like, oh, you know, the, the reason I bring that up is not to make you feel uncomfortable, all right? But, but to, to, it's very interesting as a pastor that when I talk to individuals, even if they've been in the Christian faith for some time and part of our Reformed tradition, when I say, can you give me a, a basic definition of the Trinity? Um, not so long ago, um, a younger person said, oh, you know, and they kind of struggled with it. And, and they said, well, it's just, it's just a mystery. And I, I think there, there is... I mean, the, the Trinity is a mysterious doctrine to us in many ways, but that doesn't mean that we cannot articulate or lay out clearly a basic definition of it. We can have a basic definition of the Trinity without saying we under, we, at the same time admitting we, we don't understand all of it. We know some of it, we don't know all of it, and I hope to demonstrate that. So thank you, uh, Tim, for that. So let's fill this out. Let's fill this out on the nature of our triune God. We're going to take a look at just what the Trinity is, and then we're going to, so it doesn't remain just in the realm of a theological or doctrinal formulation. Um, I want to bring out three things, why the Trinity should be important to us, all right? So let's begin with the Bible passage from 2 Corinthians chapter 13, beginning at verse 5. The Apostle Paul says, examine yourselves, he's writing to a church in Corinth, Greece, to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you? unless indeed you fail to meet the test. I hope you will find out that we have not failed the test, but we pray to God that you may not do wrong, not that we may appear to have met the test, but that you may do what is right, though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. For we are glad when we are weak and you are strong. Your restoration is what we pray for. 
For this reason, I write these things while I am away from you, that when I come, I may not have to be severe in my uh, use of the authority that the Lord has given me for building up and not for tearing down. Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. And then finally this, a Trinitarian blessing. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Now, at this point, I want to draw your attention to um, the Heidelberg Catechism. There we go. Okay. So, last time we are together, we looked at the Apostles' Creed, which is something that we're familiar with here because we confess it every afternoon service, and we did so in this afternoon service. So, as you look at the overhead, I'm going to work from our book of praise. Question 24, how are these articles divided? And you say, well, what articles? Well, the articles of the Apostles' Creed. Let's give the answer together. Let's say together, in three parts... The first is about God the Father and our creation. The second about God the Son and our redemption. The third about God the Holy Spirit and our sanctification. All right. Now, let's up the volume with the second one, okay? Since there is only one God, why do you speak of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit? Let's say it together. Because God has so revealed himself in his word that these three distinct persons are the one true eternal God. Good. Now, um, all right, so we, we, we take a look at the, uh, the, the triune God. Oh, there's so much to say, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with really um, the, the, the basics here. Um, I want to I begin with this uh, this afternoon. I want to introduce you to um, a man that I met on a plane this past week. Um, or is not this past week, but the, the week before that, toward the end of the week. His name is Richard Conlon, and I met Richard at the O'Hare Airport um, in Chicago, Illinois. Now, for, there are a number of you who know this, but some of you may not know this, that I'm on the uh, Mid-America Reform Seminary Board. So we meet a couple times a year in the spring and also in the fall. So we had our spring meeting. It was a really good meeting. And then it came time for me to travel back from O'Hare Airport to the Vancouver Airport. And so while I'm waiting um, at the O'Hare Airport, I see this man, a, a younger, well, yeah, I shouldn't say younger, but now. <laughs> Didn't used to be younger, but he's, he's in his mid-30s. Some of you, some of you in, your, in your teens think, oh, that's old. You know, what they say in the 60s? You can't trust anybody over 30 because they're too old. No. Okay, so anyway, he was a mid-30s man, and he was sitting there, he's all dressed in black. And he wasn't one of the, what we call these goth guys. He was, he was actually a Roman Catholic priest. I could tell because he had this, this Catholic, uh, he had this, um, the, uh, the sign of Catholicism here that he was wearing, the collar. And I thought to myself, oh, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk with him, you know. And, and you, know, you know how God works, right? So you're on a plane with, I don't know how many, hundred, over 100 people there. And sure enough, there I am sitting there, and he sits down next to me. And so I was in the middle of three seats, and there's a guy to my right, and he was all plugged in. And for those of us who are older, remember the days when we used to fly, and nobody was plugged in because you didn't have that kind of technology. And so you had actually conversations with people. But this guy, he was plugged in, so he was out. But Richard came in, and he also was plugged in. But I remember he, he, sat, he sat down next to me, and he did this. <clears throat> and, then, and then he got out his phone, he was reading, and I think he was like reading a meditation. I found out later that's exactly what he was doing. And so I thought to myself, well, this is, maybe this is going to be a good conversation. Well, it was like a, it was almost a four-hour flight. So I thought, well, you know, we'll pass some time a little bit later. So I wait for a half hour, 40 minutes or so. And finally, he's just sitting there. And, and, and um, I said to him, uh, so, so you're, sir, you're a priest? He goes, yeah. And he, I said, so where are you a priest? He says, well, I'm Vancouver, the diocese in Vancouver. I said, Okay. And uh, so, how long have you been a priest? And, and so, we talked about a number of things. We talked about the kind of seminary training that he went through. I mean, he went through nine years of seminary. I mean, I went through four. He went through like almost double that. So, um, and what it was like to serve in a Catholic church. And um, we just kind of went back and forth. And I, I, I found him um, very generous, very calm, 
very measured, very articulate. It was amazing to me as we were talking together, and we probably spent like just about two to two and a half hours talking with each other, how often, I was not expecting this, but how often in the course of our conversations, and it was very non-combative throughout, um, how often he cited the scripture. You know, I think when we think of Roman Catholics, oh, they just have their dogmas, they have their teachings, you know, and they're stuck in their traditions, and they, they probably don't even know the scriptures that well. Maybe the, well, maybe the priests do, but, but, you know, the main thing is the Mass and the celebration of the Mass. And we have these preconceived notions about people, you know. He was, he was citing scripture throughout, and he was very familiar with the dogmas of the Christian church. And it was just, it was, a very, it was a very interesting conversation. Now, as you can imagine, and I'll start drawing to a close here, but as you can imagine the course of our conversations, and I was very open with him that, that in a sense, I was a child of the Reformation, and I was a historic Protestant. And so, like you, I said, as Catholics, you have your Catholic catechism. I said, we actually have a catechism as well. In fact, every, every Sunday afternoon, I teach through this catechism. So we remain rooted in the doctrines of our, our faith. And as we were talking, he, we both realized, oh, we were, we were really, on, in many ways, on, on opposite sides of the fence in, in terms of the doctrines of the church. But here's the thing, and maybe you already know this, maybe in case you don't, but... There's one thing, a fundamental thing, that we, we have in common with the Catholics, and that's the Trinity. The Trinity. The Trinity was first formulated, at least the term was used, by an ancient church father and apologist, a defender of the faith called Tertullian. Um, he was the first to employ the term. And it's very interesting that when you take a look at the history of the church, and I think history is very important because when you get into broader evangelical circles, they're oftentimes ahistorical. That means they're not, they really don't know the history of, of their own church or the history of their federation or the history of Protestantism from which they are, uh, of which they are a part. So really the first 300 years of the church, there was a lot of time spent on trying to determine really who God is, particularly God who exists as in, in terms of three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So you had, the, you had the church wrestling with this, and you had church councils wrestling with this, and then they come up with the Apostles' Creed, and then you also, in the fourth century, you have the Nicene Creed, which, which is a creedal doctrinal formulation on the doctrine of the Trinity. I know some people say, well, you know what, um, the, Trinity, the Trinity term is not even found in the Bible, so they get uncomfortable with that. But there's a number of doctrines that we confess, that we use a term that is not in the Bible. But the question is, the term that we use, is the content of the terms that we use, are they actually found in the Bible? And historically, the church has said, Roman Catholic, as well as various Protestant churches, yes, the doctrine of the Trinity is found in the Bible, and we're going to look into that a little bit. Uh, in just a moment. Okay, so we're gonna, basically what we're going to do this afternoon, and I don't want to belabor this point, but we're going to look basically what the Trinity is, and then what we're going to do is we're going to um, we're going to see why is it why is it really practically important for us. Okay, so beginning of the uh, chapter, Second Corinthians chapter thirteen. Um, you know, I, I don't know if you know much about the Corinthian church, but it was a disaster. So when you read the book of Acts, you see in the beginning in Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit is poured out upon the church, and then in Acts 2, 42 through 47, you have a description of the beginnings of the New Testament church, the early church, and when you look at it, you go like, wow, it was a living church. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread, to fellowship and to prayers. There was generosity, people were sharing, and the Bible says in Acts 2.47, the Lord was adding to their number daily those who were being saved. And so the church is just mushrooming, and it's growing, and it's on fire, and oh, it was a sweet time, but you know, it didn't take long for the church to start experiencing various problems. Well, welcome to the Corinthian church. Um, the book of First and Second Corinthians actually is one of the earlier books of the New Testament that were written, so we're still dealing with very early church times. And it's a mess. You know, it's like, um, you know, most pastors probably wanna, wouldn't want to touch this church. I mean, what? It's a real problem. So you say, what kind of problems? Well, there, there was drunkenness during the, the, the celebration of the Lord's Supper. There was sexual immorality in the church. There was even a, ca a case of incest in the church. Um, uh, the, the, the people were very independent-minded, and they questioned the apostles' authority and didn't want to listen to the apostles. Um, there was infighting between the people. There were political factions. On and on it goes. 
Now you say, well, you know, why do you supply all that information? Well, to, to help us understand what the Apostle Paul is saying here in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, and you take a look at verse 5, Paul says, examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Are you in the faith or not? Because the way you live doesn't seem like it. He says, you better test yourselves. And then he goes on to say, listen, the, 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 the desire of the apostles, the representatives, the ambassadors of Christ, is that, is that you might be restored. In fact, he says in uh, verse 9, your restoration is what we pray for. And then in verse 11, he says, aim for restoration. That is, listen, you're not living right before the Lord right now. Right now, you're, you're living at a distance from Him. And what you need is you need to be restored to Him. But not only that, because of your political infighting, you need to be restored to each other. And this is why we find in, in verse um, 11 and 12 and 13, we find these one another phrases going on where he says, okay, aim for restoration, comfort one another, agree with one another, greet one another with a holy kiss. And then without getting to all the details of the passage, he ends with this. He ends with this. He ends not with clubbing him over the head and basically saying, you know, our aim for you is is what we want your aim to be for each other, and that is restoration. Now, get it with it, would you please? Get your act together. Signed the Apostle Paul. No, he doesn't end that way. He ends on a note of grace and encouragement. He says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. A Trinitarian formula. Kind of. Because here we find the three persons of the Holy Trinity. We have the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God. And we also have the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. All three persons are mentioned. But technically, that's not an adequate definition of the Trinity. In fact, in fact, you're, you're going to search endlessly um, in the Bible for just one or two verses of the Bible that would basically give you a definition of the Trinity. Okay? And this is why what theologians have had to do throughout history, especially in the opening 300 years of the church existence, what they did is they, 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 they knew that they had to, to um, produce a theology, of course, that was in a doctrine of God that was based upon the Bible, but they realized that they would have to compile a number of texts, gather them together, and then understand these texts in tandem with each other in order to formulate this doctrine of who God was, namely this triune God. So basically, theologians were taking verses from the Old Testament and verses from the New and here and here and here, and they formulate for us the teaching of who God is as a triune God. Well, what do we mean by God as a triune God. Well, um, I, I, as I was putting this sermon together, um, a lot of times what pastors will do, they'll, sometimes they face something where they kind of struggle a little bit and like go, okay, I'm called to be a preacher and a teacher in the church, but how am I going to formulate this material in such a way that it's going to be clear, and how can I formulate it in such a way that it's not going to overwhelm the people? Because, you know, we could sit here for hours and I could say, okay, now you can turn here or here or there, and Here's what we, where we find um, these various texts, and then we gather them together and we produce them. And then it ends, the, the preaching becomes just a theological lecture. So how are you going to handle this? And I thought about this, and I thought, you know what? Probably the best way at this point, and the most time-considerate way, is to go to another confessional standard of our church, which explains very simply the doctrine of the Trinity and a biblical basis for it. And there's one other confessional standard that does precisely that, and it's called the Belgian Confession. So with that in mind, if you are able to put up the belt, there you go. Very good. Um, now, it's going to get to, we're going to get some real teaching here, so I want you to put your thinking caps on, all right? In keeping with the truth of God's Word, the Belch Confession, now this is condensed, okay? And the, the, the italicized prints there, the, the, are the, uh, okay. Yeah, you can see where there, there is a, a bolder print and an italicized print. That's not from the Belgic. That's my insertion, just to emphasize certain things, just to let you know. Okay. In keeping with the truth of God's Word, 
Now, now what we're going to get into is important because this is, this is the God before whom we worship right now, okay? In keeping the truth of God's Word, we believe in one God. So what that means as Christians, and remember our afternoon service is primarily for teaching, means that we are a monotheistic people. That means we believe in one God. We're not polytheistic. We don't believe in many gods, like Hinduism, for instance. We believe in one God, as we saw this morning. Hear, O Israel, Deuteronomy 6, 4, the Lord your God, the Lord is what? Many? One. One God. Who is one single essence in whom there are three persons. Now, I've had it before in, in catechism classes throughout the years where I'll ask high school students, and even in, in adult classes, um, I'll ask, okay, give me a basic definition of the Trinity. And that's why I was somewhat curious about what you'd say. And sometimes even adults who have been in the faith for a long time will go, I believe in one God in three, and then they hesitate. Um, and they're searching. They're searching. Three, three parts, three pieces, entities. You know, they're struggling for persons. The persons is a very important thing because it reveals not only a distinction within the Godhead, but that God has personal traits, relational traits. I'll get to that a little bit later. In keeping the truth of God's Word, we believe one God who is one single essence in whom there are three persons. Really, not apparently, truly, not falsely, and eternally. That is, that, that the Father didn't become the Father at a certain point in time. Or Jesus was not created by the Father, and then He becomes a person in time. Or the same with the Holy Spirit. Each of the three persons, and this is where it gets mysterious, because it doesn't accord with human rationality or reason. But God exists as one God, three persons. Each of the persons of the Godhead has the full essence of God in them. So we say that God the Father is fully God, God the Son is fully God, God the Holy Spirit is fully God. Not one God, and the Father gets a third, and the Son gets a third, and the Holy Spirit gets a third, but they're all fully God without being three gods. Oh, well, you can kind of see why some people, unless they accept the limits of human understanding, they go, that doesn't make rational sense, and therefore I or we reject it. If you ever dealt with Jehovah Witnesses, that's exactly what they'll tell you. It doesn't make, make rational sense. God is a God of order and reason. He, wouldn't, he would not display himself in, in, in a way that we cannot understand. And we say, well, we can understand, but there are limits to understanding. There is a certain level of mystery to this that we simply accept. Ooh, okay, one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. All of this we know from Holy Scripture, which teaches us to believe in the Holy Trinity. This is written in many places in the Old Testament. So what's nice now is that what the Belgic Confession does is it focuses on some Bible passages. Take a look at it if you would. Let's go back to the book of Genesis, the very first book of the Bible. God says, let us make man in our image. And so God created man in his image. And he said, behold, man has become like one of us. Now listen closely to what it says. It appears from this that there are a plurality of persons within the deity when he says, let us make man in our image. You would think that God would say, let me make man in my image. But he doesn't. He said, let us make man in our image. If God is one, then why do you find the plural, us and our, right? Now, let us make man in our image, and afterwards he indicates the unity when he says God created. It is true that he does not say here how many persons there are, but what is somewhat obscure to us in the Old Testament is very clear in the New Testament. So God says, let us make man in our our image. So God says this, single, in our image, plural. Now, he, does, he didn't say, let's make man in our image, namely Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Old Testament doesn't say that. So what you find in the Bible is actually in the Old Testament, whether it's referring to the Trinity or even referring to Jesus Christ, it speaks in a kind of veiled, general, somewhat obscure way but as you read on in your Bibles, and this is the fascinating thing about the Bibles, as you read on, you find that that which is kind of shadowy and obscure in the Old Testament becomes over time more and more clear 
more and more explained. It's a very interesting thing about the Bible. Same thing here, the Trinity. Now, we come to the New Testament. For when our Lord was baptized in the Jordan River, now here you have the three persons of the Godhead. The voice of the Father was heard saying, there's the first person of the Holy Trinity, this is my Son, second person of the Holy Trinity, and the Holy Spirit appeared in the form of the dove. So in the baptism of all believers is found, uh, so in the baptism of all believers, I think the word the is missing, is the form prescribed by Christ, baptize all people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. That is interesting too in the, in the baptismal formula. When Jesus gives the great mission commission, he says to his disciples, I want you to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Notice what he says. He didn't say the names of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Name, singular, there's the unity, but then you find a diversity in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So all through the Bible, what you find are two things together. Are they fully explained to us? Not always, no. But you find unity, diversity. One God, three persons. In another place, it says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Sound familiar? That's the text that we read in our scripture reading. Finally this, okay? In all these passages, we are fully taught that there are three persons in the one and only divine essence and although this doctrine surpasses human understanding, we nevertheless believe it now through the Word, waiting to know and enjoy it fully in heaven. The very point that the Belgic Confession makes is right on. Basically, it's saying, listen, um, the, the Trinity is not so mysterious that we can't say anything about it. We can. We can get a basic definition. But to understand it in its entirety, to understand it exhaustively, it's kind of a wait-and-see attitude, Right? We, um, what does the Bible say? Because of our fallen condition, we look through a glass darkly. We don't know everything. But one day when we get to glory, we're going to know much more about who our God is. Um, will we know everything about who God is? Probably not. We'll still be creatures, right, without sin. But, but um, I can't answer the question about exactly how much more we're going to know about God. We'll have to wait and see from the Lord himself. But all we know now is that we can know God truly without knowing Him exhaustively, okay? Now, I know we're kind of digging into some stuff, and it's pretty, it's pretty theological, but I think it's really important for us to, to understand this, which, which gets me to the, just the, 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 only, the second point this afternoon, and the only point, remaining point, is that, and that is this. Okay, so, and especially with kids in catechism classes, like, okay, well, now I know the Trinity, I guess, but so what, you know? Why is it Trinity important, and why is it, um, why is it so serious if we deny it? And why is it important that we affirm it? I want to I leave you with, with, with three things. First of all, the Trinity helps us to understand God's relationship to us. God's relationship to us is a singular love that comes to expression in each of the persons of the Godhead. And what I'm about to say is I want you to see the, the beauty of the doctrine of the Trinity. So we confess one God with a, a singular profound love that is manifest through each of the persons of, of the Trinity. God's love for us in Christ, God's love for us is not... I should put it this way. God's relationship to us is not a relationship of rejection, but acceptance. It's not a relationship of rejection, but it's a relationship of love that comes to expression through each of the persons of the Trinity. I want you to think about this. How does love, how does God's, God the Father's love, how is that expressed to you? You think about this, from all eternity, love was shared between each of the persons of the Godhead. 
So, listen, again, we're not like, um, like Mormonism, we're not like Jehovah Witnesses. The Jehovah Witnesses say, well, you have one God, and you have Jehovah God, and then you have Jesus Christ, who is not one in essence with God the Father and Holy Spirit, but He is of just a divine nature created by God, and then you have the Holy Spirit, who's not even a person at all. The Holy Spirit's just a power, it's just a force. So we confess. And for good reason, because the, the beauty and the love of God is diminished through such an understanding. So when we say, when we talk about a triune God, we're saying, okay, God, God is, is one, God is one, and that love for us is profound and singular, but it comes to expression through the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So again, how, how do you understand the love of the Father? Well, think about this. The love that God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit experience from all eternity is a love that God desires to share with us. Theologians talk about what we call the aseity of God, that is the self-contained nature of God, but God is not so self-contained that He says, I'm not going to share my love. I'm going to do that. I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do that. So the Father says, I love you. I love you so much that I am, in your fallen state, I'm going to give my one and only Son over to death, to suffering and death for you. John 3, 16, right? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son so that whoever believes on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's the love of the Father. But then you have the love of the Son. You say, how does Jesus love me? Jesus loves you so much that He was willing to say, you know what, Father, that's what you want me to do. Even though I am equal with you and co-powerful with you and co-eternal with you and co-essential with you, I'm going to willingly empty myself and I'm going to humble myself in obedience to your will for the sake of my people and I'm going to purchase them and I'm going to die for them so that they will not die but so that they will have life. Love of the Father, the love of Jesus, and then you have the love of the Holy Spirit. How does the Holy Spirit love you? The Holy Spirit loves you so much that He says, you know what, Father and Son, from whom I proceed, what I'm going to do is I am also going to give of myself self-sacrificially. I'm going to come alongside of my people, but not only that, I'm going to live within them, and I'm going to grant them the gift of faith so that they will be drawn to Jesus and so that they might know joy and life in this life as well as the life to come. That's the love of the Godhead. That's the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I mean, that, that is amazing. So it's, it's not too much for me to say to you right now that without the love of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, you and I are eternally lost. Without, without God, or without hope in the world. So that's number one. To, to understand the Trinity is to understand God's relationship to us, but to understand the Trinity is also to understand our relationship to the world. Think about this. I'm going to get a little philosophical here, but you know, for, for many years, great thinkers throughout the centuries have observed the world, just as you and I observe the world, and they saw a whole lot of diversity in the world. They saw diversity in nature. They saw diversity in animals. I mean, think about that. You have all kinds of animals. You have mammals. You have different kinds of fish. You have also... Um, just uh, differentiation between types of peoples, skin colors, cultures, perspectives, philosophies, all that. So here's the point without going on and on. The great thinkers of the world looked at all the diversity in the world and they're thinking, but what's the one thing that binds this diversity together? And what's the one thing that provides meaning for all the diverse things that we find in the world? It's called the one in the many problem or the one in the many question. Philosophers have been dealing with it for many years. So how do, how do we resolve this, right? Well, if you take a look at a religion like Islam, re, re, uh, Islam is a religion, uh, it's a monotheistic religion like the Christian religion. There is no God but Allah, right? So you have, you have a belief in one God. You will not find diversity in the Godhead within Islam. In fact, they think it's a terrible thing to say that God has begotten the Son. Right? And you talk about the Holy Spirit? No, you read the Quran. I've read the Quran in English a number of times. It's really kind of interesting. And they have a, first of all, Muhammad has a very improper understanding of the Trinity. And so they just saw Trinity and they thought, oh, that's polytheism. You have three gods. No, that's not what the Christian church taught. Okay, so you have, you have, you have unity in Islam, but you don't have diversity. You look at Hinduism, it's a polytheistic religion. You have many gods, you have a plurality, but you don't have unity. You have diversity, but you don't have unity. 
But then you look at the Trinity and you have unity and diversity in perfect harmony. It's not too much to say that the triune God is the one who helps us to understand and properly interpret the world around us and truly appreciate the world around us. Unity and diversity both provide, or both of them together provide the answer to what we find in the world and how to interpret this world. So, one final thing, and I want to draw it to a close. The Trinity, God is one God in three persons, not only helps us to understand God's relationship to us and our relationship to the world and our proper interpretation of the world, but what the Trinity does finally is helps us to understand our relationship back to God, which, which if you properly interpret Christianity, is a very personal relationship. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. Sometimes in conservative circles, we go, you know, when people talk about a personal relationship with God or a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and some, not, not always, but some people kind of get a little, little nervous with that. That's what, what other Christians talk about. We don't, we talk, don't talk about, that, about God in that way. That's not, that's not right. It's not, it's not even remotely biblical. The relationship that we have with God is a very personal relationship. Why? Because God is a personal God. God is a relational God. God is one God who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So think about this. And then we're going to draw it to an end. Um, God the Father is not just, just a God who is out there, but think about it. He is your Father. He's your Father. A Father who loves you, a Father who, like a good Father, not only loves His children, cares for them, provides for them, blesses His kids, knows them by name, God is a, is a, is a, the Father is a, a personal God, wherein our response to this God then is, Abba, Father. Moving on, even Jesus Christ. You know, Jesus Christ took on human flesh. That was part of his humbling, right? Here he was, eternal God in the heavens. He takes on human flesh so that he may become one like us. We've looked at that in the series on the, on the catechism, a few, like, I don't know, a couple months ago now. Jesus is, is eternal God who took on human flesh. He became one of us. He is, he, he, he is a person. He's a human person, right? And, 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 and the, the, the personal nature of Christ is such that he says, I'm not only going to give myself over to death personally for you, but he says, I, I'm going to call you friends. When, when we see the healing ministry of Jesus Christ, he's, he's, you know, the, he's healing various people, and it's the, and the Pharisees who says, oh, Look what he's doing for tax gatherers. And look what he's doing for, for prostitutes and everything. And, and Jesus was known as the friend of sinners. That's a very personal designation, isn't it? Where we can, we can say to Jesus, Lord, Lord, you're my sovereign king, but you're my loving friend. You're my friend, and I am your friend. I mean, that's the language of the Bible. So God, the Father, is a personal God. Jesus is personal. And then, you, and then we get to the Holy Spirit, and you kind of go, now this has always confounded me because, well, the Holy Spirit, man, um, how can a spir spirit be personal? How can you even speak of the Spirit as a person? You ever struggle with that? Well, the Bible doesn't have a problem with that. The Spirit is a spirit, but it's interesting the way that the Bible speaks about, uh, um, about the Spirit. When you take a look at the Holy Spirit, when you look at the Gospel of John... And maybe I'm getting a little technical here, but I, I think it's important. When you look at the Gospel of John, the, the, the Spirit is referred to not in a neuter sense, not a female sense, but with a male pronoun. The Spirit is referred to as he or him, personal language. Also, when you take a look at the Bible, when you, when you consider um, the Spirit, the work of the Spirit, it says it, the, the Spirit is described in very personal terms. It's the Spirit who comforts, it's the Spirit who teaches. It's the Spirit who encourages. It's the Spirit who can, at times, be resisted. It's the Spirit who blesses. It's the Spirit who testifies to our spirits that, you know what he says? You are children of God. Very personal language in connection with the Holy Spirit. So, here's the thing, without going on and on. The, the Trinity helps us not only to understand God's relationship to us and our relationship to the world, but also our relationship back to God. God is a personal God, and therefore He's a relational God, 
And the kind of relationship that we are to have with Him is not to be one of distance, but one that is personal and one, as we saw this morning, that is full of love. Now, tell me that that's not important then to understand the Trinity. If we don't know the Trinity, we can't truly appreciate the kind of relationship that God has for us and our relationship with God and our relationship to the world. So, in explain all that, I just want you to, to go away with this. The Trinity is more than just a theological formula that we, gonna, we need to get in our noggins, you know, that we need to understand. But the Trinity affects everything about our lives and our relationship with God and also our relationship with each other. There's a, there's a wonderful book that was put out. If you can remember the title, if you like to read, it's called Delighting in the Trinity. I think it's by a man named Michael Reeves. I think it came out about uh, 10 years ago. It explains the Trinity very very well, very simply and clearly and in a very applicable way. And Michael Reeves writes this. He said, you know, the Trinity, he says, affects everything about our lives. It affects how we listen to harmonies of music where you have all these, we have all these different instruments and, 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 and all these um, uh, different expressions within a musical piece and you see all these different parts but you see how when a symphony plays them there's, there's not just diversity but there's, there's unity. There's a reason for that. It's because the world's been created by a triune God. It affects how we listen to music, to how we pray. It makes for healthier marriages, warmer dealings with others, and a better church life. It gives Christians assurance. It shapes holiness and transforms the very way that we look at the world around us. He says, no exaggeration, the knowledge of this God turns our lives around. Well, Hopefully, as we consider this material, I know we got into some depth on some of these things. We move kind of quickly, but hopefully, we don't we don't come away from this afternoon going, "Well, okay, now I got a better definition of the Trinity. Now I can tell other people about it." I mean, that's important, but hopefully, we come away from this with a a more profound sense of of the mystery of God and and also the beauty of God, which may translate into greater lives of doxology, that is, greater lives of praise and worship and love. All right, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we draw near to you, and um, we, we are amazed by the way that you have revealed yourself to us, O God, as Father and Son and Holy Spirit. It is... It is because of its ultimate mystery a very humbling thing for us. But at the same time, Lord, it's, it's um, I trust, a very beautiful thing for us as we, as we begin to discover the implications of how you have revealed yourself for your relationship with us and our relationship with you, our relationship within the body of Christ, those who possess great diversity here at Pathway, but are united together in one faith, in one Lord, in one baptism. And we pray, O oh Lord, that you um, would, would, would bless, the, bless the sermon and may it redound, O oh God, to a greater sense of love and joy and then also commitment to you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.